We are now recording. Thank you, Jenna, for coming along to give us the talk tonight. We're all looking forward to it. Um, I travelled sure so it's... far tonight. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. So over to you. Um, that we will try and have time for a few questions at the end, but obviously, as it's post AGM, the time the time is fairly limited. Mm -hmm. But we will look to finish by nine o'clock. Well, I will go quiet now and hand over to Jenna. Jenna. Uh, so um, can everyone see that? Yes. Oh. Um, <clears throat> so yes, I'm doing a talk on Alan Turing, um, who lived from 1912 to 1954, and his life and legacy. Um, so very, this is my first talk, so um, please be nice. <laughs> um, I will say I'm a lot, I'm sorry. So very quickly, who am I? Um, my name is Jenna Mercy Pateman. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to use they, them. Um, I am a history graduate from the University of Gloucestershire, which is how I became a member of the HA. Um, I'm currently a master's student at the U University of London at Goldsmiths College, studying queer history, which is why I'm doing a talk on Alan Turing today. Um, I'm also, <clears throat> as stated earlier, a historical association committee member both of the Gloucestershire branch and the members and branches committee, which is a head office um, committee. Um, my still, uh, that went wrong. My field of study is actually tends to be on how history is represented through media and public history. Although at the moment, due to my um, being a student and queer history, it does have a queer tint to it. Um, I am what's referred to as a podstorium for Real History UK, um, which is my podcast that I co-host with one of my very good friends, Hugh K. David. And I'm very passionate about um, history, a bit of a geek, um, what's called an ACA fan, which means that um, I'm an academic fan of things. So I study things that I'm into as well as enjoying them. I have a thing for animation. I'm bisexual, I'm autistic. Um, I'm a mum and a wife. So yeah, that's pretty much sums up who I am. Um, the picture of me is actually of me presenting my dissertation, which I did a few years ago for the University of Gloucestershire, which was actually on Walt Disney and the 1964 World Fair, which was a really, really fun little project to do. So very quickly, who is Alan Turing? Uh, what And what is he famous for? So I did a very, very scientific um poll well not poll but um i put this picture up on social media and went hey people without looking up what um who he was what do you know about him and i got a few responses which um kind of overwhelmed me um i will put all of these up later i'll find somewhere to put them um they're all available publicly on um, my social media, which is great. Um, and it was a giant mixture of friends, people I've never met. Um, yeah, it was really good. Um, so from those responses, I got what he was famous for, uh, which was being a code breaker and bre breaking the Nazis' Enigma code. Uh, basically helping save the world from the Nazis. Uh, he worked at Bletchley Park during World War II, which went on to become GCHQ, which as a member of the Gloucestershire branch, GCHQ is a very important thing to Cheltenham's history. Uh, the Turing test and Turing machine. He was the father of modern computing. He was a genius. He was a solitary man, um, likely autistic. He was rather good at maths, which I quite like that one. Uh, he was gay during a time when that was problematic. He died for being gay. He was played by Benedict Cumberbatch in The Imitation Game in 2014. He was pardoned for his crimes, and he's on the new £50 note. So, it's, it's a nice summary of basically who he is. But obviously, with every single person, there's a lot more to him. So, I'm going to, as quickly as I can, go over his life. Um, so this is him as a child, 
absolutely adorable picture of him in the sailor suit. Um, he was born the 23rd of June uh, 1912 in London. So he was the second son born to his mother Ethel and his father Julius. Julius worked for the Indian Civil Service at the time and so was going back and forth between India. Um, his parents decided it would actually be better for the two kids to stay in England so they would leave the kids with the, his, the two sons with friends while they were out of the country and so he got quite used to not seeing his parents. Um, according to his family he was actually quite a mischievous young boy um, but that's very likely from a sort of natural inquisitiveness. Um, he was also quite shy and awkward, but also quite eccentric, which um, I will go into more detail in a bit. Um, he showed very early signs of being a genius. Um, he actually supposedly taught himself to read in three weeks, which um, as a mum who has a, a seven-year-old, yeah, if it didn't take my daughter three weeks, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, he had very early respect for rules and the concept of fairness. Um, his mother once skipped some of the books she was reading, which was the Playground's uh, Progress, and he got very upset by this because it was against the rules of uh, reading. Um, he then also discovered his love of numbers and maths at a very early age. Um, <laughs> the really cute thing is that after he discovered sort of numbers and the joy of numbers, um, he would stop at every single lamppost on any walk he was doing so he could read the serial number. And not for any reason, he just wanted to find out what the numbers were, which um, is quite adorable. So he went, obviously he went to school. He went to a couple of different schools. Uh, just one sec, I'm gonna see if I can move that. Perfect. Um, so he attended St. Michael's from six to nine years old. And his headmistress had noted that she had had clever boys and hardworking boys, but Alan was a genius. Um, he attended Hazelhurst prep, prep School from 19 to 13 years old, and then attended Shelbourne School from 13 to 18 year old. Uh, Shelbourne is more centered on a classics education while uh, Turing, obviously lent more towards science, which put him very much at odds with his teachers to the point where he was caught in a study session for religious study doing, um, oh, what's the word? I can't remember. Ah, maths with, num with letters, um, algebra. Um, as you do, you're sneaking off to do extra maths. And he got majorly in trouble and his uh, teacher made sure he failed both, both of the lessons instead. Um, very importantly at Shelbourne School is where he met Christopher Morcom, uh, who he formed a very significant friendship with and has been described as Turing's first love. He unfortunately died in February 1930 from complications of bovine tuber tuberculosis. Um, from drinking milk um, a few years beforehand. Uh, this absolutely devastated Turing and um, he actually spent many years writing to Christopher's mother um, and keeping in contact with her as well. So he went to university and obviously because he didn't have to do religious or classics education anymore, he earned a first class honours degree in mathematics at Cambridge uh, University King's College. Um, he was also elected as a fellow of King's College due to his dissertation, which proved the central limit free room. Um, there are many, many things that um, he wrote about that I tried to understand. And to be honest, completely went over my head. It was like, OK, cool. That's that's sort of makes sense, I guess. I'm not great with numbers myself. Um, he earned his PhD at Princeton University from the Department of Mathematics. And it was here that um, he published one of his sort of more famous um, theories. Um, so it was called On the Computable Numbers of the, with an application to the 
oh dear, uh, X Endurance's problem. Uh, so this is where the Turing machine came from, uh, which was a universal computing machine and would be capable of performing any conceivable mathematical computation if it was represented as an algorithm. So it basically, if you ask a computer a yes, no question, it should be able to answer. Um, that's what I sort of got from what I could read about it. So he actually went from Princeton and started straight away with the government code and cipher school, which was known as GC and CS. Um, this was what went on to become GCHQ and who operated Bletchley Park. Um, right at the start of when um, he joined, he started concentrating on breaking the Enigma machine, uh, which is the picture of the machine that you see on the side. Um, the Polish had actually been able to break the Enigma in July 1939. Uh, however, it relied on three conditions that uh, the Germans just simply changed once they found out that it had been broken. And so they had to sort, they didn't have to start from scratch again, but at least they had sort of like a foundations of where to learn to try and break the code again. Um, the Polish did share this information with the French and British, uh, especially as they were getting invaded, um, which obviously started World War II. So Bletchley Park, um, I think one of the more famous sites that he's known for, um, the day after um, Great Britain declared war on Nazi Germany, he reported straight to Bletchley Park and signed the Official Secrets Act. He was like, hi, I'm here, I'm doing my duty. Um, within weeks of arriving at the site, using uh, the Polish bomber as a foundation, as I mentioned, him and his team created the bomb. Uh, the first one was installed on the site on the 18th of March, 1940, and it was thanks to a lot of his um, calculations that was able to translate um, the Enigma codes into the messages. Uh, by the end of 1939, he had decided to move to Hut 8 uh, to concentrate on the German naval Enigma as they were actually using a more complex code. He was like, oh, this Enigma, it's not enough of a challenge for me. I'm going for the hardest one. And also because no one else was doing anything, he could have it to himself, so he could sort of have his own little department. Um, so this is a picture of the NIG machine at the bottom, and then at the top you've got the bomb, which you can sort of see the size comparison. So to work out what this basically typewriter was saying, you needed a computer that filled a room. Um, which was insane. There was a couple of reasons that the team at Bletchley were able to break the Enigma. It's from the Enigma's design, it actually meant it wasn't perfectly random. There were still some calculations involved. Um, the Enigma operations operators um, kept using stock phrases. Uh, the most famous one is the Hal Hitler because obviously in every message, we must be patriotic towards our Führer. Um, then also in weather reports, they would always use the word wetter, which is German for weather. And so through that, they were able to go, right, this is this word, so we can work out what this might be. Um, because the machines never coded a letter to itself, so, H would never be H, T would never be T. Um, these stock phrases, as I said, could be used to crack the settings for the day. Although throughout the war, the Germans kept adding extra things, which would then set the code breakers back extra months. They would carry on, keep on solving it. Um, the main reason that the Enigma machine failed was because the Germans were overconfident in it. And um, although, they would change it up. They didn't change enough. 
So it got broken, which, yay, go us. So um, although the um, team was having success translating the encrypted messages, um, they were very limited on staff and limited on bombs. Because obviously the more bombs that they had meant that they could translate more messages more quickly. Um, so Turing and his team wrote uh, to Winston Churchill basically to plead for more money. Uh, the, on the side is actually their email, uh, email, not email, um, letter that they wrote to him. Um, mentioned the fact of they enjoyed when he came to visit them. Um, he... Sorry, I just noticed I'm sorry. There we go. Um, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. He um Turing was actually the main person, the first signature on it, although it was a team letter. Um Churchill's response to the letter was actually to go, this needs actioning right now. We need to make sure that they have everything they need. Um their extreme priority, and it meant by the end of the war, there was over 200 bombs, so those massive computers, uh, not just Bletchley, but other sites, and by its height, Bletchley staffed over 10,000 people, around three quarters of which were women, which I think is really important to mention, um, that Bletchley was mostly staffed by women, and the women did amazing work with the codes. Um, Stuart Miller Barry, uh, who was a fellow cryptographer with Turing, uh, did mention that they didn't actually get told that Ch uh, Churchill said the okay to their letter. They were never informed. And they weren't basically, they did notice that suddenly things got a lot smoother, uh, that things that were rough to get or they couldn't get their, their bosses to okay, suddenly were easier to get, which must have been quite exciting. So during World War II, um, he did other things, like he wrote two papers uh, discussing the mathematical approaches um, called the Applications of Probability to Cryptography and the Paper for Statistics on Replications. Um, the interesting thing about these papers is that they weren't actually declassified for a very long time, not until 2012, after GCSQ basically could squeeze every single little bit of juice out of them. Um, they were that important to GCHQ and to cryptology. Um, he also traveled in 1942 to the US to help them with their cryptologists and their bombs, um, although apparently he wasn't actually that impressed with theirs because he was like, but oh, you're making them too cheaply and they, you're not quite doing them how I would. Um, he also assisted at Bell Labs with secure speech devices. He returned to Bletchley in 1943 and um, although he returned and was the leader of her eight again, um, he basically went to a sort of more consult, consult role um, for cryptanalysis there, but stayed at her eight. Um, him and many, many other people at Bletchley were awarded an OBE for his work. And the official war historian, Harry Hem Hemsley, estimated that the work done at Bletchley Park actually shortened the war in Europe by two years and probably saved 14 million lives which is an, a massive achievement. Um, this is one of my favorite bits about him. Uh, so life during the war, he was basically known for being a bit eccentric. Um, he was quite well liked though. Um, his colleagues would call him Poff uh, as a professor um, and his treaty on the enigma was known as Professor's Professor Book. Um, According to uh, Jack Good, a cryptanalysis who worked with him, he would do things like wear a gas mask while cycling in June to avoid hay fever and occasionally uh, exhaust fumes as well. Uh, Turing's bike would actually break down quite often and 
instead of like getting it repaired, he would just count how many pedals it would take for the chain to fall off and then fix it. Um, instead of actually going to get it repaired, um, like that was more of a challenge to him than actually getting a new bike chain. Um, he, <laughs> as you can see in the picture, he chained his mug to the radiator pipes um, to ensure it wouldn't get stolen by anyone because he was obviously he's British. He needs his tea. Um, and because he never told the code uh, people the code to lock, it's actually still there today, which is great. Um, he enjoyed run distance, long distance running and would actually run 40 miles from Bletchley in his work clothes to, to London to attend meetings, which is absolutely insane. He would do this because he thought it was quicker. Um, he would turn up to work in his pajamas. He wore his trousers held up by a tie instead of a belt. Um, his long distance running was actually so good. He almost made the Olympic team. And very importantly, he did actually become engaged to a young woman named Joan Clark, uh, who was also working in her eight. He did call it off, uh, although this wasn't because of her, because he she was actually like completely unfazed by his homosexuality. Um, it's very important to note that in 1941, um, marriage wasn't quite seen as we have it now. It was more, um, it was a social duty. It was what something you had to do. It wasn't the way that we consider it as what you want sexually or anything like that. So, yeah. So his life after the war, he actually um, carried on working for GCHQ, but as a consultant. Um, and he also continued working for the government uh, at the National Physics Laboratory and helped design the automatic computing engine, which was also named ACE, which it's one of those things of, I wonder if the acronym came first and then they were deciding which way to put it. Um, he also presented a paper on the first detailed design of a computer, a stored program computer. Um, he found it very problematic for explaining his work due to the Official Secret Act, and he got very disillusioned with it. Um, because without going into details of what he did at Bletchley, he couldn't explain everything. And so to people that didn't know about his work at Bletchley, it was very difficult to explain how this computer worked. Um, he then moved to Cambridge and he worked on a new paper called Intelligent Machinery. Uh, this was not uh, published in his lifetime. Um, then a few years later in 1948, he moved to Manchester to become the appointed reader in the mathematics department of Victoria University in Manchester. And then he became the deputy director of the computing machine laboratory, which um, that laboratory, I believe, is now actually named after him. Um, so suddenly, random picture of a sunflower. Why, why is this here? Um, so one of the things he did actually research into is mathematics. Mathematical biology um, was he. He was very in, uh, interested in morphogenesis, which was the development of patterns and shapes in biology organisms. So this would be, for example, the center of a sunflower and what how it makes the patterns um, in a pine cone. How, how those work. Um, he published uh, the chemical basis of metamorphosis in January 1952. And he, it's still a very similar piece of work in that field. And it is used to explain growth of feathers, hair follicles, the branching of um, the sort of tree-like branches in lungs. Um, it was a very important paper, um, like all of its research is still used today. Um, 
It was also in Manchester that Turing produced the test known as the Turing test, which attempted to define a standard for computers to be called intelligent. Um, we actually use a form of the Turing test in everyday life, which is with the Caperture test, which is when you go to a website and it goes, are you a robot? And you click on like photos or you have to type something from a picture. That is the, a reverse version of the Turing test of basically going, hey, are you, actually, are you a bot or a person? Which is very interesting. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, he was famous for being gay. Uh, his homosexuality is a big reason of why he's a celebrated figure now. Um, he was actually a very open homosexual, as much as he safely could be at the time. Um, many of his close friends were aware of his homosexuality, even if they were straight themselves. Um, sorry, my daughter wanted to say goodnight. Um, although his school friend Chris uh, Morecambe was, as I said earlier, believed to be his first love, it was at Cambridge that he really got to start exploring his sexuality. He was able to engage in relationships without having to worry who might find out and what others might say, especially as the university was actually quite largely accepting of homosexuality. Obviously, it wasn't outspokenly accepted. It was just a simple, yeah, okay, we, we ignore it. It's just something that's going on over there. Um, he was actually a very sexually active man. Um, he and appeared to enjoy sex with men greatly, which um, good for him. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, in January 1952, it was actually enjoying a burglary um, that he reported to the police that he, during the investigation into it, he acknowledged to the police that he was currently in a sexual relationship with a 19-year-old man named Arnold Murray. Um, and obviously because of things at the time they weren't very happy of that so his conviction uh, Turing was charged and found guilty of gross indecency under section 11 of the criminal uh, law amendment act in 1854 I can't speak today 85 um, so the interesting thing about that law, where is it? It was actually a sort of last minute, where is it? Yeah, it was last minute to be added onto that law. Uh, the House of Commons was half empty and the MPs and in attendants were basically really uncomfortable with discussing the subject. And so it was added without debate. They were just like, no, we don't want to talk about this. So, okay, we'll just add it. Um, it is also the exact same law that Oscar Wilde was um, sent to prison under, over. He, um, so Murray received a conditional discharge after Turing actually spoke up for him in court. And However, because of Turing's lack of remorse and the fact that he was like, yeah, I did it. He pleaded guilty. Both of the men pleaded guilty. Um, he was, um, what's the correct word? He would either be given a year in prison or a conditional probation where he would have to undergo injections of a silicon estrogen in the hopes of reducing his libido. Um, this was considered lenient to him because um, people from out his life came to talk for him. And this was actually quite dangerous, especially for actual straight people, because if you spoke at court for someone that was gay, you would get tarnished with the, tarnished with the same brush. So by a couple of his colleagues coming from Bletchley, who were married and straight and had lives they put a lot on the line just to say yes this guy is a really good chap and he's amazing at what he does and they 
basically spoke up for him, which was amazing. Um, so he was put on estrogen. Um, before he started the treatment, he said, no doubt I shall emerge from it all being a different man, but quite who I have not found out. Um, this treatment rendered Turin impotent and uh, caused breast, breast, breast tissue to form. Um, so he basically developed a woman's chest. Um, the reason he went decided to go down this method rather than going to prison for a year was mostly so he could keep his job at the Manchester University. Um, however, he did lose his security clearance and so was not able to continue uh, working for GCHQ and then got denied uh, the entry to the US states. Um, so obviously Alan had a much more severe punishment than Murray, even though they are both first time offenders. Um, this can be seen for a couple of different reasons. So Turing's um, mother was from the gentry and so his class was supposed to, he was supposed to set a better example for lower classes. So he shouldn't have been doing what he did. Um, there was also something called the Lavender Scare, which was going on in the UK and the USA at the time. He, him and a lot of other homosexual people, which included men, women, trans people, anything that was considered queer, um, were basically hunted for, like um, how anti-communists were hunted for during the Red Scare. Um, so this campaign, the Lavender Scare, basically linked homosexuality with communism. And because it was basically as anti-American as you could get. Um, one representative in America actually stated that the Russians are strong believers in homosexuality. And sometimes he wondered how many of those homosexuals have had a part in shaping our foreign policy. How many are in sensitive positions and subject to blackmail? Um, thousands of people lost their job because of the lavender scare. And from my research into it, it appears actually more people lost their jobs due to the lavender scare than the red scare, which is its much more famous counterpart. Um, over a thousand people were fired from the State Department alone in America. And this obviously had an impact on the UK. Um, because of our close relations uh, with the United States, especially during the Cold War. The other thing that might have affected it is, although he wasn't famous, he wasn't the household name he was now, he was actually semi-famous. Um, he would appear on BBC radio shows to talk about computing. Uh, unfortunately, um, those tapes don't exist anymore, which would have been wonderful to listen to. Um, he was also semi-famous with those within that, the field that he worked with. So often it's been reported that after the estrogen injections, he was depressed, he was sad. Um, not quite. I mean, he was actually saying that he felt that the treatment was actually working. Writing to a friend, he said, I had a dream indicating quite clearly that I am on the way to being hetero, although I don't accept it with much enthusiasm, either awake or in dreams. Um, obviously, from that, I think it's that sort of thing of he kind of wanted to be straight. He wanted to be normal but at the same time he still enjoyed being homosexual so obviously there's that whole debate in his own mind um he also appeared to be really still enjoying life taking a holiday and he was planning for the future uh writing to this in the same letter as the quote above 
He said, I expect to lie in the sun, talk French and modern Greek and make love through the sex and nationality has yet to be decided. And a fact that it's quite possible that this item will altogether be omitted. I want a permanent relationship and I might not feel inclined to reject anything of which its nature could not be impermanent. So he wanted to find someone he could love. He possibly wanted to settle down and possibly get married. Obviously, for a gay man, that wasn't possible to do to a man, but we don't obviously know what will happen. Um, according to his friends, he also uh, bore the legal setbacks and his hormone treatment, which only lasted for a year, uh, with some good humour and, according to them, didn't show any sign of depression. On the 8th of June, 1954, Turin's body was discovered in his bed by his housekeeper. He had died by cyanide poisoning. Um, this came as a shock to a lot of his friends. Um, there was an apple found at the side of his bed, and it was thought to, that's how he consumed this sort of fatal dose. Um, although it is actually very important to note that the apple was never tested. Um, a lot of his well, not a lot of his friends, but a few of his friends actually commented on the fact of he really enjoyed the Disney film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Rick was quite fascinated by the scene of the poisoned apple. So people considered that to be kind of his way of going out. Um, there are a couple of theories for his death. Um, the main one is that he committed suicide uh, which was deemed the official reason why he died. Um, as I said, people associated him with Snow White um, and sort of going into a sleep after eating an apple. Uh, people like his own mother, um, obviously quite upset by the fact of her son may have committed suicide, uh, reported again that he didn't appear to be depressed he had equipment out that was using um, cyanide uh, to do metal plating. And he was very known to be very messy. He didn't often clean up after himself. And that he had a list of tasks that he intended to complete when he went to the office the next day. It's... This, it's kind of sad to think that he could have died by a complete accident, that he just so happened to have an apple and it was cyanide and it accidentally got po he accidentally got poisoning. Um, the other theory that um, has been reported is that he could have been assassinated. Again, this was due to the lavender scare. This was due... Um, to the fact of although he wasn't famous, he was known and obviously he got reported in the papers as being homosexual. Um, this theory is quite a bit of a conspiracy theory, but although I'm not quite sure if it was if it's fact or not, I thought it was still a good idea to say this is a theory that people have. So he was cremated at the Woking crematorium, uh, crematorium on the 12th of June, 1954, and his ashes were scattered in the gardens there. He was, um, which is actually the same place his own dad's um, ashes were scattered. One of the saddest things about this, he was 41 years old, which was such a young age to die. So moving on to his legacy, um, he is now a household name, which is amazing. Um, in 2002, he was ranked the 21st SCH. Greatest Britain. Um, in a sort of UK wide poll, he um, by so 17 years later, uh, the BBC conducted another poll, um, and he was actually ranked number one, which shows in actually really quick piece of time how he got went from no 
known about to actually really known about to the fact of he's outranking people like Churchill, Princess Diana, um, Kingdom Brunard, uh, Bernal even. He, um, people that would top these lists of 100 Greatest Britons. Um, in public spaces, there are now blue plaques on his homes and where he worked. That many statues have been built in his honor. There are buildings named after him. There's roads named after him. There are wards. Um, and this piece of art that you see is actually from the, uh, the floor of GCHQ. So for a while, they had this beautiful piece of art on their floor, which you could only see by satellite, which was a bit weird, but yeah. Um, the reason that he wasn't more well known during his own lifetime, or it took a long time for him to actually be known, can be seen to be due to the secrets about what happened in World War II. Um, it only slowly became declassified. And so as it slowly became declassified, people were learning what heroes that everyone that worked at Bletchley Park, including Turin, were to the war effort. Um, because of his prominence in Bletchley Park, obviously his name right, rose to the top of people recognised for their effort there, but there are thousands of people that were there and deserve to be celebrated. Um, one of the most important things I think is also as history has evolved, more diverse people are getting to be talked about, which is great. Uh, there are many more figures that I wouldn't have known about it, going to school. I mean, when did I go to school? 20, 30 years ago. Um, that my daughter, who is attending primary school now, is learning about um, very early on, which is great. Um, his homosexuality now, um, although he was persecuted in his own, his own time, is now more celebrated. Although it's not like, woo, woo, he's gay. Woo. It, 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 it's something to bring him up and go, hey, look, look at this amazing guy. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I look at media uh, a lot. And that's what I do with my podcast. So I have to talk about the imitation game. Um, this was a 2014 film. It won Oscars and it starred Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch as Alan Turing. Now, like a lot and basically all historical media, especially biopics, there are a few problems with the film from the nitty little nitpicky things to he was arrested in um, 1952 when the film depicts it as 1951 um, to that he helped in espionage. Uh, although there was espionage happening at uh, Bletchley Park, it was in a very different department from him and he wouldn't have likely met the person because the the different departments weren't really meant to mix. Um, also, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch plays him as a very stereotypical autistic gentleman. Um, he's basically doing his Sherlock Holmes from the TV show Sherlock. Um, he's shown him as a loner, a non-team player, and in the film he gets very confused by social situations, like um, the team asking if he wants to go to lunch, and he's like, no, but will you get me something? And a lot of confusion is happening. When, as I mentioned earlier, he was actually really well liked, um, although he was eccentric. Um, my main problem with the film, and this is something that I think has happened to him quite a lot, is that barring a chase note to Christopher, who, the young boy he was in love with at school, he's never depicted as being romantically or sexually with another man, which for one of Britain's most famous homosexuals is a bit of an issue. The film feels very straight wash. So we're going to depict him as this queer mar um, martyr, 
but we're not going to show any of the things that might make a straight audience a bit uncomfortable. Um, there is actually another drama, which is a bit closer to his life, uh, called Breaking the Code, which is from the 1980s, 1990s, and it's a bit closer, but obviously it's still not perfect. So as I was mentioning, for the film, he was not depicted romantically or sexually with another man. This has sort of led to him being sort of made safe for children when obviously there's a lot of parts of his life that are safe for children and safe for history for kids. Um, but it feels a lot like they've just cut out a lot of his sexual relationships and his sexuality, apart from mentioning, oh, he was gay. Um, making him into a British hero and a role model for people that want to get into STEM. Um, now, I'm not saying that this is 100% a bad thing. Uh, this book that um, I've got on screen is actually, I've got it right here. Um, I bought it for my daughter to help teach her about Alan Turing. Um, it is a lovely uh, book and it's got some really beautiful pictures. Um, it does sort of talk about his very briefly talks about the fact that he was persecuted and the fact of things are changing now and people can be in love with who they want to be. Um, but at the same time, it, for a very sexually active man, his sexual relationships are not discussed very often. Um, in the imitation game, it appears that he was arrested for espionage rather than the burglary and Murray isn't really mentioned at all, even though that was an important relationship to him. Um, also on my hunts while I was um, in work, sort of in the works, I found this book, which is Maths Games for Kids, Alan Turing, uh, which highly amused me. Um, so he's kind of like, woo, STEM hero, get your kids into STEM, look, it's Alan Turing. So. That was very interesting. So in conclusion, I found a couple of little quotes that I quite liked. Um, his life was some, could be summed up by a um, plaque that is on his statue at uh, the University of Manchester, which is the father of computer science, mathematician, logician, wartime co-broker and victim of prejudice. And um, for a way of not talking about it, him for like, well, I don't know how long I've gone on now, I'm really sorry. Um, it's, that is a quite good way to sum him up. Um, a really nice quote I found from Andrew Hodges, who wrote um, hit the main biography of him, which is this, which is uh, The Enigma. Um, which came out in the 1980s and was one of the first pieces properly on him. Um, he reported that he would have probably loved to see the changes in same sex uh, equality. He received a royal pardon last year, but how terrible he didn't actually live to see this more civilized uh, nation emerge. It's also really important to know that he probably would have hated all the attention that got, went on has gone on him because he was actually a very humble man. Um, he made sure that all the credit was spread around um, every one of his team and that names were added to papers and stuff like that. So he always wanted to make sure that everyone was credited for their own work. I, to me, Alan Turing is a personal hero for me. Uh, being a queer woman, um, it's lovely to see a queer figure celebrated in my own home country. It's also uh, partly to do with me being autistic. It is nice to see someone else that had this amazing success that, again, is represented. His, insist, insist, uh, sentish, his quirkiness just learning about that makes him come alive and 
makes him such an interesting person. Like, to me, th- the fact of he decided to run 40 miles to go to London because he felt it was quicker makes complete sense to a lot of people. That just sounds dumb. <laughs> but I can see how he got there in his mind. Um, I am so happy that he is on the £50 note, and which is an amazing thing. However, it is important to note that the £50 note is the least used note in circulation. So how many people actually get to see the picture of him is a bit questionable. So yeah, um, I hope I hope that this is okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that was okay. Um, so please listen to, if you didn't find my voice too annoying, uh, please listen to Real History UK, which is available on all good uh, podcasting platforms. So your iTunes, your Spotify's. Um, I'm actually going to be on Radio uh, Gloucestershire on the 12th of October from 6 till 10 with John Smith. I'll be talking everything history and the HA. And our next HA talk is on migration and the Anglo-Irish relations in the Middle Ages. And that's on the 25th of October at half past seven. And that's also going to be on Zoom. And if you want to find me on social media, you can find me at Nadesco Kitty and at Real History underscore UK. Thank you so much for listening and I hope